Dear Father, thank you so much for these precious friends. And we ask that you guide us now into your word, that we may receive what we need from your hand. Your word is full of grace and light and life and hope and courage. Bring our classmates today, Lord. And let us have a wonderful time in your word, a life-changing time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, what do you know about the Bible? How do you know? By faith? Well, some people have faith in the Quran. And some people have faith in the, in the Hindu Vedas. And some people have faith in the Buddhist writings. And so why do you have faith in the Bible? It uh, changes me. Ah. So you're testing your faith by your experience. Hmm. Are you sure you trust the Bible? Or do you just want to trust it? <laughs> we reach out for something that we can trust, don't we? We need something we can trust. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I find. I. I agree that testing the Bible, it meets the test. So uh, we know he doesn't let us down. And that's wonderful, isn't it? It doesn't let us down. And uh, I know that the other philosophies in this world do let us down. They fail us badly. Well, the Bible teaches about a certain kind of God. All the holy books tell us about God, right? So-called holy books. Uh, but the, the, the version of God that the Bible teaches is the version I want to believe, because it's the best version. So, just because I want to believe it, though, does that make it a good thing? <laughs> I think a lot of Christians lose their faith because they realize the reason I believe what I do is because I was told to. And uh, somewhere along the way, being believing what you're told fails you, doesn't it? Because you find that you were told a lot of things that weren't true. You know, rub a rock on your wart and throw it over your shoulder and it'll go away, right? No. Many of the things you were told don't work. <laughs> so we need to have better reasons for our faith than that. Some people think they should study every religion and then compare them. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, studying every religion is, could be rather confusing. <laughs> it's quite an undertaking. Yeah, it would be a real undertaking. It's no hurt in knowing some of the basic tenets. And what I found is um, once, you've got, once you've proven the Bible, and we're lucky because we start with the Bible. We're, we're on a Christian part of the world. Some people start with the Quran and then have to figure out the truth after they've been confused with the Quran for many generations. But we get to start with the Bible because that's you know, what's native to us because of our heritage and the Western European heritage. We're so blessed by that. And then after you've proven the Bible, then to look at the others a little bit and know what they're saying. And right away you find out that they say things that disagree with the Bible, don't they? And once you've decided the Bible is the reliable source, then we test other things by the Bible. Isn't that right? So what does it say in Isaiah 8? Yeah, you remember it, don't you? <laughs> All right. You learned that. Where, where, how old were you when you learned that? Uh-huh. When you were a kid, huh? It was a useful study for you, wasn't it? So I wish all of our kids knew that and believed it. 
Let's look at that, Isaiah 8.20, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. All right. So we do test all the other claimants by God's law and God's testimony. Okay, God's law is the first five books of the Bible, and God's testimony is all the rest. And that's what we test everything else by. Right? Isaiah 820. Mm -hmm. So, what about the things that we just, we don't think they're scripture, but we watch them and listen to them and read them anyway because they're entertaining? How does that affect our, our belief system? Can we start believing things that aren't biblical just because we keep hearing them all the time? Oh, yeah. The force is with you. Yeah, the force is with you. <laughs> he really is, and it's not the good force. He's always trying to influence you in the wrong direction. So is it safe to expose our minds to contradictory philosophies other than the Bible? It's not safe to do it a lot, is it? Not a lot. No. If you're, if you're uh, entertaining yourself with things that teach you a different value set, that's dangerous. Because you might start thinking sin is not sin, and righteousness is not righteousness, and you might even lose your faith in God altogether if you're exposing yourself repeatedly to faithless material. Now, what if you get addicted to it? A lot of people are, aren't they? A lot of people are. That's a very common thing. Satan has made his brainwashing material quite entertaining. Hasn't he? Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're somewhat fleshly still, you find his brainwashing material quite entertaining. And uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to get loose from that. Uh, you know, what philosophy is primarily promoted in the popular media of today? Is it a philosophy that God is good? Not really. Is it a philosophy that God can be trusted at all times? Most of the great heroes in the popular media are people who do it themselves. And they don't need God. And they, have, and they will say right out loud, if you're listening at all, God, you know, I tried God, but he let me down. I just have to do it myself. That's what they will say over and over and over again, because that's Satan's brainwashing. God will let you down. You have to take care of matters yourself. And of course, they're constantly telling you that, that you can't have a satisfying life without sinning. That sinning is required for satisfaction. And so that is part of the brainwashing, isn't it? Part of the brainwashing. And so you're hearing it, and you're hearing it, and you're hearing it, and you're hearing it, and you're hearing it. And you don't believe it, and you know it's not true. But it goes into another part of your brain, a sort of subconscious part, which is able to believe something other than what your conscious brain believes. Because if anybody asked you, is it necessary to sin to enjoy life, you'd say, your intellectual side would say no. But this other secret subconscious part of your brain might say yes. <laughs> So when we're brainwashed, it bypasses our intellectual side and we act out of this hidden command center in our brain that tells us things that our intellect doesn't even believe. That's tragic. So if we're sure that the Bible is the truth and we want to pattern our lives according to it, we read nothing but the Bible. Is that it? I know people who have gone to that extreme. Well, that seems like it'd be safe, doesn't it? But, in fact, that might be a little too extreme. Because you do need to know something about what's going on in the world. And it might be too extreme from the standpoint that you might end up resenting it. And saying, well, I'm just not even alive. I'm missing out on everything. And, uh, and then if you were doing it but not 
but, but resenting it, then you wouldn't like God and you'd lose your connection with Him anyway. So we must be very careful how we uh, appraise the things that we're exposing ourselves to. But um, uh, we, do, we do have to live in the world even though we're not of the world. So that, that needs to be a balance. I think it's important for Christians to say, what am I learning from this? What's this showing me? What's this teaching me? And then say, maybe I need less of this. Maybe I need, don't need this at all. And start weeding out the input that they have. Because if it's teaching you something, even though you say, I'll never believe this, but if it's teaching you something contrary to God's Word, you might end up being influenced by it in the long run. Is that true? Yeah? Am I barking up the wrong tree? How many of you think the devil is constantly trying to get our attention away from the Bible and into many, many other things? He is. And he has a reason for that, doesn't he? Because he wants to weaken our faith if he can. All right. What do you think about Jesus? Did Jesus know the Bible very well? I think he did? Uh, you know, I believe that Jesus did what, um, what David says he did. Go back with me to Psalm 119. Yeah, he is the Bible, huh? But as a man, he learned the scriptures too, didn't he? Yeah. Do you think he was born as a baby with the whole Bible memorized? No. That would be a real advantage, wouldn't it? <laughs> but no, he had to learn it just like you and I do. Psalm 119, and let's look at verse 11. <clears throat> and um, let's read that together. Do you have it in whatever version you have, it doesn't matter. Let's read it out loud. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. All right, so Jesus was a great student of God's word, and he took advantage of every opportunity that he had, didn't he? So that he could be the holy man that he was, that his mission required him to be. And so he hid God's word in his heart. Do we have much evidence in the Gospels that Jesus knew the Bible? Tremendous evidence, don't we? He quotes it. He said, it is written. He could answer all the devil's temptations with the Bible. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He knew chapter and verse. That's right. Yeah. Jesus was extremely well accomplished in the Scripture. So uh, he always had a Bible answer for everything. Now, that sounds almost legalistic, doesn't it? Did Jesus live by the Word, or did He live by His connection with His Father? Or is there any difference between the two? <laughs> he obeyed the objective Word, didn't He? But He lived by His connection with His Father in the sense that that's where He got the power. Now, who gave the Bible in the first place? Mm-hmm. Who stood on Mount Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments? It was Jesus who did that. That's right. So when Jesus obeyed, he was obeying his own commandments. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder as a young man when he realized that he was God. Usually people don't realize that until they're quite a bit older. <laughs> It's not, very rarely do children think that they are God. But Jesus became aware that he was God, you know, at a younger age. And they thought he was delusional too when he started saying that. You read the Gospel of John, Jesus says over and over that he's God. And they knew what he was saying. And they said he's totally delusional, which is exactly what I would have said. I would have said he's totally delusional. God is God and you're a man, so you obviously aren't God. That would have been my pat answer. Wouldn't it have been yours? Who expected God to come down in the flesh in Jesus' time? They expected a Messiah, but they didn't expect him to be God. So I, I, have, I am completely sympathetic with their lack of faith. Uh, yeah, but he said to them, now listen, I don't expect you to believe what I say just because I say it, but somebody is witnessing about what I'm saying. If you had talked to my father about this, he would tell you that I am God. And then he said, 
And if, what I, and if my words don't help you believe, look at what I'm doing. Can anybody but God do this? They were pretty blown away by that. Especially people that were born blind or born deaf. They were pretty blown away. The, 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 the Pharisees did not want to believe in him because they didn't like what he was saying. So they didn't want to believe that he was God. And so they found exceptions in his teaching to pin, you know, to hang their disbelief on. Well, you know, he couldn't be um, from God because he's from Nazareth. You know, that proves it right there. And he couldn't, <laughs> they had many, many reasons. The Savior, the Messiah is not supposed to come from Galilee. So he cannot be the Messiah and therefore he cannot be God. Satan will use the miracle proof. Yeah, the miracles. Mm -hmm. We don't immediately reject miracles, because if we'd done that, we would reject Jesus. Another Moses. Yeah. Yeah, or even a Moses and a Joshua combined. Someone that would be a very great war leader. And they knew he would be righteous, but they didn't expect him to be so careless of materialism. They, were, they, they hated that. They just hated that. Jesus was not interested in material things, was he? And they, 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 that was just awful to them. They resented that. And he told the young man, sell what you have and give it to the poor and follow me. And he said, everything else about you is attractive, but that is not, that's not right. So they looked at Jesus as a terrible fanatic and a deluded person. When he died on the cross, they said, that proves that he's not God. God can't die. Yes, it wasn't easy for them to see that. Um, they, they did not accept that as referring to the Messiah. They had not, several different interpretations of those passages. But they chose to look at all of the glorious passages. You know, the ones about the kingdoms of the world all collapsing and being under the leadership of, of uh, God. And, and the ones about, you know, all the wealth of the Gentiles coming into Jerusalem. And, all those passages, and they chose to reject all the passages that predicted a suffering Savior and um, repentance and conversion and all those. So Jesus totally offended them because he ignored all the passages about the glorious fulfillment and, the <laughs> and he just went to the passages about the suffering and the conversion and the humiliation and the and the character change and so forth. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that that sincerity issue because some of them are quite sincere, aren't they? And they and they and they and they love God, but the Jews claim to love God too, and then when he really came they didn't know it was him. So you could be loving the wrong person, couldn't you? Loving a, a manufacturer of your own mind um, when you misinterpret the scripture. And by the way, I think we all misinterpret the scripture to some extent or another. I just want to misinterpret it as little as possible. I mean, none of us can, we all see a slightly different view, don't we? It's like the, it's like the three men that inspected the elephant, you know. They were all, they had to stand still was a problem. They could only inspect the part that was right in front of them. So. One was standing by the tail, and he says, well, the elephant is obviously a lot like a rope. <laughs> Another was standing by one of the big sides of the elephant, and well, the elephant is obviously a lot like a wall. And another was standing by one of the legs, and he says, well, an elephant is obviously like a tree. <laughs> and the three blind men. But we, we are kind of like that, but I hope not that drastic, because it is our privilege to examine all the scripture, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the scripture says that they will try to deceive even the very elect. Right. 
And it says, if it were possible, I'm so glad it's not possible. Why is it not possible? Because they filled themselves up with the truth to where they know it. They know it. Just like Lonnie just told me, if it's not according to the law and the prophets, there's no light in it. <laughs> All right. But we are led astray by our own desires many times uh, from God's word. How well did Jesus know the Bible, do you think? Let's go to Matthew, where Jesus quotes Matthew 3 where G or 4, where Jesus quotes some of the Bible. And I want you to see what he said in verse 4. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. All right? Deuteronomy, where does that come from? Anybody know? It's Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, isn't it? So did Jesus know the Bible quite well? How many of you would have known Deuteronomy 8, verse 3? <laughs> you know Matthew 4. <laughs> But do you know the Deuteronomy version of it? <laughs> Let's look at the Deuteronomy version. Keep your finger in Matthew 4 there. Deuteronomy 8. So he humbled you, verse 3 says, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So that's what Moses told the people in his great sermon just the day before he died. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth. So Jesus was very familiar with that. Now notice that first verse that he told Satan. Satan should have given up right there. Why? Because he not only says, man shall not live by bread alone, but he says by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Satan should have known right there, if Jesus was going to stick by every word, he was not going to be successful in tempting him. But Satan thought, well, I can, I can play that game. So what does he do the next time? Matthew 4, verse 6. Satan quotes the scripture, doesn't he? He says, for it is written. Isn't it great to hear Satan preaching? It is written. How often do you think Satan preaches from the Bible? Frequently. On the television, on the radio, in the churches, Satan preaches from the Bible over and over again. Because he knows the Bible very well too, doesn't he? <coughs> now what did he, how did he misuse the scripture here? Let's see if we can understand this. It is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. Where is he quoting from? Psalm 91. All right, Psalm 91.11. And then he continues quoting, In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Where's he quoting from there? Verse 12. Hmm? Verse 12. Okay. Now Satan realizes that it's okay to quote. You, can't, you don't have to just leave your quotes only from Moses. Jesus quoted from Moses. And Moses was considered to be the greatest authority, wasn't he, in the time of Jesus. Moses' writing was considered the top-notch writing. And then all the others was just supportive of it. That's why Moses' writing was called the law. And all the other writings were called the testimony. All right, But the testimony was also reliable. So Satan knew that Jesus also believed the testimony. So he preached from, to Jesus from the Psalms. Both from Psalms 91. He starts with verse 11. And then he goes back to verse, or on with verse 12. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now what is Satan doing with the Bible here? Let's go back to Psalm 91 and see if Satan is qu qu quoting it correctly. Uh, 
By the way, do you like the 91st Psalm? It's a very beautiful psalm, isn't it? And he knew it was a comfort and that many people had memorized this psalm. So he says, He shall give his angels charge over you, in verse 11, to keep you in all your ways. Verse 12, In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, is this psalm in any way encouraging people to jump off of pinnacles? <laughs> Do you see in here that the Lord says, Go ahead and jump off pinnacles. You know, the angels will catch you. <laughs> it does say he'll protect you. You know, verse 7, a thousand may fall at your right side and ten thousand at your, at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. So all these disasters will come upon God's enemies. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. So he's saying this happens to those who put their trust entirely in God. And the plagues don't even come near your dwelling, where he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. So the angels will keep you in all your ways. It doesn't say anything about the angels taking care of you when you do something stupid, purposefully stupid. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra and the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Has anybody ever used that verse as an excuse for handling deadly serpents? Yeah. They have used it. But does it anywhere say there that you should go out and pick up deadly serpents in, in order to prove this verse? <laughs> what I'm, the point I'm making is that Satan misuses the scripture. He takes it and puts extra meaning into it to suit his purpose. And he, t and he leads many preachers and many others to do that too, to go beyond the straightforward meaning. It's really warm in here, and to me it seems airless. It's probably because of the, all those fumes. But I see that all of you are having a really hard time staying awake and a hard time concentrating more than usual. So I don't know if it's that or just because I'm really boring today. In a way, he's doing it because he's taking the power of God and he's telling you you're God. You, oh, you have the power to do these things. We do, but it's through him. <laughs> well, he obviously was saying to, yeah, yeah. He always says that. You're, you're your own God. But it's obvious that he's saying to Jesus here, you need to test this. You need to test this angelic protection. Here's the promise of the angelic protection. Okay, we all see that, right? How many of you feel that you've ever been protected by angels? Yeah. I feel I've been protected by angels many times. But now he's, he's adding to the scripture, now you need to test this protection. Does the scripture ever suggest that you test this protection? No. He's actually, what he's doing in Jesus' case, is he's tempting Jesus not to believe that the Father is taking good care of him, that he needs to jump out and you know, put this thing to the test. He wants Jesus to doubt his calling, his mission, his Messiahhood, and he wants him to feel like, oh man, maybe so, maybe I need to do something here to, to, to cause a miracle to happen, to, to bolster my faith. By the way, I am convinced that Jesus had already worked a lot of miracles. I do not believe that the, the miracle in Cana was his first miracle by any means. I believe there are a lot of unrecorded miracles that he worked, little hidden behind the scenes miracles that he worked when he was a younger person in, in Nazareth. The catechism, he made some doves and they came to life. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't know if I believe that story, but I do. It, it, it was the apocrypha, yeah. But I do believe that he had, had, uh, had a confidence that God would use him miraculously before, before the Cana story. Uh, Mary had confidence. He wrote about everything that Jesus did. Oh, yeah. You could never even put it down. Yeah. See, even Mary knew that Jesus could solve that problem with a not enough wine. So she had seen miracles. She had seen miracles. She wouldn't have known. 
And she said, oh, well, leave it to him. He'll fix this. Well, what does he think he was going to do? Just do whatever he tells you. He'll fix it. She knew he was going to do something because she knew nothing was beyond his reach. So she was already convinced of his powers. But um, Jesus, of course, was not exercising any power in his own behalf there. And Satan seems to have known that. So Satan didn't tempt him. At first he tempted him to do it himself, make the bread into, into uh, the stones into bread, right? And he wouldn't do a miracle on his own behalf. So his second temptation is, okay, then, you know, get the angels' attention. Get them to come and help you. You need to demonstrate that you are who you think you are. And so he was tempting Jesus to disbelieve God's promises, the word, all the interpretation of the word that he'd so far had his own internal evidence that he was the Messiah. He was tempting Jesus because of his apparent, uh, apparently ab apparent abandonment in that wilderness where the Spirit had led him. Wasn't he all, uh, apparently abandoned there? The, the Spirit, remember it says in the earlier verse, the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And so there he was, you know, just kind of alone and on his own. But he didn't, but he wasn't alone because he had the Word. How powerful is the Word of God? Don't you understand that if you, if you lay claim to the promises of God's Word, God is already there with you through the Word. The, all the power of God is in His Word. And so God Himself is there with you in His Word. It's a tremendous thing. If our faith grasped that more often, we really would be powerful men of God. We really would. Because God is there with us in the Word, isn't He? Yeah. And so when Jesus quotes the Word and, and, and with an obedient heart, it's just awesome. And then Jesus brings another scripture to bear. Now, what principle does this teach us? Verse 7, Matthew 7, Matthew 4, verse 7. Jesus does not say, you've misused that scripture. He just quotes another scripture. This time again from Moses, Moses Deuteronomy 6, 16. It is written again, you sh shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, Satan said, it is written. And then Jesus said, but it is also written. So what, what, what was Jesus doing here? How was he using the Bible? You could say, well, he was fighting the Bible with the Bible. <laughs> no, he was applying a principle of Bible interpretation. What is that principle? That the Bible interpreted itself. Yes, and that you need more than one scripture. See, you could misunderstand one scripture. Potentially, you could read... The angels will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone to mean, okay, jump off a cliff and the angels will make sure you don't get hurt. You could interpret it that way. It's an extreme interpretation, which most rational people wouldn't come to. But nevertheless, you could if you didn't have another scripture. So what do we need to do to arrive at truth from the Bible? We need to look at multiple scriptures, don't we? Yeah. Could you believe some weird things? if you had only one scripture that you were basing your belief on? How many of you have come up to scriptures and said, ooh, if I took that in one of the ways that it's presenting itself to my mind, I could get some crazy stuff out of this. <laughs> oh, there's quite a few of those churches. Yeah, they have them in Oklahoma too. Um, no, but can, can, can you see how, I mean, I could, I could interpret things quite easily, you know. Take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Okay, I better be a, a wino then, you know, to be in harmony with Scripture. <laughs> um, you know, um, and, and I could take some of the Scriptures about uh, um, you know, the multiple marriages of, the, of the pa pa some of the patriarchs, and I could say, oh, God, God honors this multiple marriage thing. I should marry several women. And uh, you, need to, you need to... Compare scriptures with scriptures. Is that right? That is the safe method. Do you know, do you know why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist? I'm so thankful that our, our leaders were careful. And when I realized this with my own study and I saw that, that how, what they had done before me, it was a blessing. It gave me great confidence. Our leaders were careful to compare scriptures and compare scriptures until they knew they had the biblical position. You could believe, you could come up with a scriptural reason for believing that God's okay with you honoring Sunday, couldn't you? You could come up with a scriptural reason for believing God's okay with you honoring Sunday. Do people come up with such a reason? Oh, yeah. 
Yes, 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 yes. They certainly do. But if you compare all the scriptures relating to the holy day, that, that, doesn't, that, that, you, that doesn't have enough weight anymore, does it? Those scriptural arguments they come up with are not sufficient to prove their point against all the other scriptures which indicate that God's holy Sabbath day is forever sacred. Yeah, and you just said something about baptism for the dead. Who baptizes for the dead? The Mormons, the Mormons do that. That's right. And how many scriptures do they base that doctrine on? One Bible verse. Right. Right. No, it doesn't make any sense. But I mean, you could believe that from the Bible because the Mormons say very clearly when they're giving you studies, everything we teach is from the Bible. And they have a Bible, and they don't only teach the Bible, they teach the Book of Mormon, but everything we teach is supported by Scripture, they say. And they have a Scripture to support everything they teach. This one about baptism for the dead is not the only one. They have the idea that women, you know, can't go to heaven unless they're married to a Mormon man. And they have a Bible Scripture for that. They have a, they have a Scripture for everything. But they don't have the Scriptures. In other words, they don't take the whole Bible and, and make sure they're in harmony with what the old prevailing view of Scripture is. And that is what our Advent, huh? They just say it was changed. The Bible was changed. Well, they can say that, too. It's an easy out, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, well, it was changed, you know. That's an easy out. But I think, I, am, I, am, I tell you what, I'm just, I'm just more thankful every day that passes for what our uh, Adventist pioneers did because honestly, one of the biggest things they did, folks, was in discovering how to find truth from the Bible. Remember, all the other denominations had the Bible too and based their teachings on Scripture. But the, but the Adventists came up with a safer interpretive method, which is what? Make sure, you, make sure your conclusions about this point are based on every relevant scripture. That is a that is a vital interpretive position. Because you haven't you, Yeah, I was gonna go there in just a minute. Ha, haven't you all had arguments with people on the Bible? And if they're good Bible students, don't they bring scriptures to support of their position? Yeah. Yeah, they do. They do. I had a person tell me, you know, according from Romans, we are not saved by the law. Does the Bible say that? Yes. Absolutely. And so their conclusion from that verse was, therefore, it's irrelevant for us to keep it. Because our, our, our goal is to be saved, right? And if our goal is to be saved and we're not saved by the law, then keeping the law is irrelevant. There's something wrong with that, isn't there? Well, there's something wrong. And they didn't read all the scriptures. Because if they go back to Revelation, the last chapter, it says that those who have right to the tree of life are those who keep the commandments. So they obviously are not putting all the relevant scriptures together. When Paul says we're not saved by law keeping, he's absolutely right. But what he doesn't tell you in that passage, you have to find somewhere else is that you can be lost for law-breaking. And you will be lost for law-breaking. So you may not be able to be saved by law-keeping. Why can't you be saved by law-keeping? Because no amount of law-keeping could make up for all the law-breaking you've done. That's why you have to be saved by the cross. Amen? You have to be saved by mercy and grace. But does that then mean law-keeping is no longer important to God? No, many scriptures say it's very important, and if you refuse to keep the law, then ultimately, and, re and make yourself a rebel for your whole life, I can't take you into my kingdom, I can't have rebels in my kingdom, even though I died for you, and I, and I covered your law breaking, I can't have rebels in heaven. So, he's, so obedience is still essential. And so, and so they just didn't read enough of the scriptures. They, they found a scripture which they could interpret in a way that made them comfortable. Is that not a challenge to all of us? 
We've all been challenged by that, haven't we? Oh, I like that verse. I'll just hang on to that verse. <laughs> I had one guy, I kept narrowing him down as we studied, you know. Uh, I kept narrowing him down. And he says, well, I don't go by that. That's the Old Testament. I don't go by that. That's Moses. Moses has been superseded by Christ. Well, I don't go by the Gospels because Jesus was living under the Old Covenant, you know, and the New Covenant started when Jesus died. And so I don't go by the Gospels. And I don't go, and so finally I narrowed him down. The only passage that he was sticking to was Galatians. <laughs> I said, my friend, you've just wiped out 99% of the Bible and you're hanging on to Galatians. And you really think, and you really think that Galatians disagrees with all the rest of the passages. And if it does, you're willing to stick with just that one verse, that one book. I could see he felt a little uncomfortable with that. But he, he maintained. So it's, you know, I, didn't, I didn't break him down. He maintained. My faith is based on Galatians. All right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with him any further. Well, I could see I wasn't going to. It's like you lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You know. So, what? Well, the Holy Spirit can, yeah. 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 See, if he'd read Galatians carefully, he would have seen right in the context that Paul is not telling us to be disobedient, even in Galatians. But, bless his heart. He didn't do that. So, we see Jesus using the Bible correctly. He puts together several scriptures to make sure he has the right interpretation. What does he find? What does he get out of Deuteronomy um, 6 there where he says it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. What is he getting out of that verse that, that counter counteracts Satan's false interpretation of Psalm 91? What's he getting out of that? You shall not tempt the Lord. You don't know? Can you question? What, what is Jesus, how is Jesus using that verse so that it counteracts Satan's false interpretation of the previous Psalm 91 verse? How is that any answer? You should not tempt the Lord. Is he saying, don't tempt me because I'm your Lord? No, he's not saying that at all. He's not making any claims about himself here. Yeah, he's not actually addressing that either. I mean, that, that undoubtedly is in there, but that's not, that's not the main point. He's just telling him within God. Huh? He's making a statement, but he is No, that's not it either. I, I, maybe so, partly, but that's not the point. What's the point? He's using it to counteract Satan's false use of Scripture. Satan said, throw yourself down, the angels will pick you up. And he is using this verse correctly. This verse says, don't put God to the test, or don't be presumptuous. In other words, don't Make God work a miracle for you. That's what Deuteronomy 6 means. Don't make, don't make God work miracles for you. He'll work miracles for you when He wants to, when it suits His purpose, and you know, when, it's, when, when you've stumbled into trouble you know, through no fault of your own, or sometimes even through fault of your own. But anyway, He'll decide when He's going to work a miracle. You cannot purposefully make God do a miracle. Don't say, okay, God, I'm going to stop steering my car now. You take over. That's what this verse is about. Don't put tests to God. There's only one place where God has said, test me. And what is it? Tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings right. Give me your money. Give me more money than you think you can afford. And, and I will work a miracle to make sure that it works out for you. That's where God says, you can test me. Every place else God says, do not test me. Which means, don't put yourself at risk so that I have to come up with a rescue plan. Okay? And so he was using that scripture, which he knew well, and he knew the exact meaning of it, to counteract Satan's misinterpretation of the earlier scripture. And that's what we always do when we study Bible with people who are misinterpreting scripture. We point them, others, we should point them others, to other scripture, which is very plain and very clear, in which they cannot misunderstand. And we say, see, if this scripture says this, then the way you're reading your scripture must be incorrect. Oh yeah, if you have several of them. Well, they can say, well, that's just the way you're interpreting it. But some scriptures are so clear that there's no interpretation necessary. <laughs> I like to find one of those. Now let me tell you something about doctrines. I don't think we should make a doctrine that is not 
extraordinarily plain in the Bible. You may know it's correct because of what Ellen White says, or you may know it's correct because it just makes sense in harmony with the other scriptures you've read. But if it's not really plain, we should not make a doctrine out of it and expect somebody else to believe it. That's why, for instance, we don't have a doctrine of vegetarianism. What we can teach very plainly about vegetarianism is that it was God's original plan for us. That's indisputable. But then we have those other passages where God said, go ahead and eat this and this and this and this and this. And we don't have anything specifically undoing that later in the Bible and saying you need to go back to God's original plan. Do you know of anything that says that? Would it be smart to go back to God's original plan? Well, obviously. He gave us the best plan to begin with that would be smart. But we can't make a doctrine out of it, can we? It's the future diet, too. We're getting back to that tree of life. Absolutely. So we can show that, and we can show that. But one of the reasons why vegetarianism is not one of the Seventh-day Adventist doctrines yeah. is because it's not indisputably a, a requirement of God under the New Covenant. And, and, and so, you know, we have many things we believe that really don't fit in the doctrine category because we cannot nail them down sufficiently from the Bible alone as, as requirements, as must do, as must believe points. I believe that there is a council in heaven and that all the planetary leaders from the various planets in the universe come there from time to time to discuss the universal issues, whatever they may be. But the only place that supports that in the Bible significantly is Job's, you know, opening chapter. It's a great chapter, but it's not enough to make a doctrine out of. So we don't say, you have to believe there's lots of planets and they all have their planetary leaders and there's a big council that meets in heaven and the, plan and the council members come from each planet. You don't have to believe that. Evidence will never make you believe that. Because there's not enough verses to make you believe that. Even though that's pretty clear in Job, it's only one passage. You see what we're saying? Let me tell you another one. Oh yeah, she talks about it. She supports that idea. It's biblical, it's in Job. But you see, we, we don't want to do what the Mormons do and make doctrines out of something God only mentions once. If He wanted to make a doctrine out of it, He would have mentioned it more times. That's one of our principles of Bible understanding. If God wants something to be a doctrine, He's going to mention it a number of times. I have the same viewpoints, and I am treading on thin water, thin ice here, maybe water. <laughs> I have the same viewpoint about foot washing. I totally believe in foot washing and think it's a real blessing and everybody should do it. But how many passages of Scripture support foot washing? One. John chapter 13. That's it. Is that enough to make a doctrine out of it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they did a lot of foot washing in those days. Remember that they were that was the Roman culture. You didn't go indoors without somebody washing your feet, and uh, so that was that was expected. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do foot washing. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for it, and I will promote it to the day I die. But is it? Can it be one of the central doctrines with just one verse to support it? I hardly see how. That's not the way we make any of our other central doctrines. I hardly see how. You get the point? We want to base our things that we tell the world in the Three Angels' Messages, they have to be based on a lot of Scripture. Solid, biblical interpretation of Scripture. I know, it's hard to weed that out if you're just, yes, yes. But in evangelism, we need to be sure we weed out the extra things which are precious and a real blessing. Ellen White doesn't say things that are not at least implied in Scripture. I've never found one thing that she says that isn't at least implied in Scripture. Maybe her statement about Orion, I don't know where she got that Orion statement. But I mean, everything she says is implied in Scripture. And it's a lo logical deduction from Scripture. But many of the things she says, we cannot teach as doctrines. She says that you should build your house on, a, on high ground, you know, 
not in the valley, and uh, in an area, you know, where there's not too much moisture. But the Bible just implies that the wise man builds his house on the rock and so forth. But it, it's, 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 it's just in a, you know, it's not, a, it's not actually a statement that Jesus is making about architecture. It's actually a metaphor he's using about having solid faith. So, you know what I'm saying? We don't have, we can't make a doctrine out of that. And I'm really glad, because I don't want to have 300 doctrines. <laughs> we couldn't remember 300 of them. <laughs> but there's tons of wisdom in the Bible, isn't there? Well, right now, the church lists 28. Yeah. Can I get a copy of them? Yes, of course you can. I would be happy to do that. In fact, do, shall I, I, I don't know that I can just round it up today, but shall I take down your phone number or something so I can give it to you? Are you seeing her fairly regularly? What's your name again? I know Sarah. you, but okay, so Sarah. Sarah Wong. Sarah, yeah. I love that name, by the way. I have a very good friend by the name of Sarah. Will you make sure she gets the 20, a list of the 28? There is an abbreviated list, you know. We have it in a book. It's like 300 pages long. <laughs> but we have an abbreviated list of them that you can have. No problem. All right. And what I like, really, is a shorter list because 28 is too many. <laughs> I don't want to get rid of any of them. But what we have is we have some lists several different lists, but we have some lists where some of them are combined, because some of them really go in groupings better anyway. So they're combined. I like the lists that are like 20 or 18 or somewhere in that number, because they've combined some of the ones that kind of fit together. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's, that's a valuable thing. Well, let's go to the scripture that uh, Timothy, um, Timothy in his enthusiasm for Bible study blurted out. <laughs> I like it when you guys are thinking of scriptures that support what we're saying. 2 Timothy 3.16. Oh, excuse me, that's not right at all. It's 1 Timothy. <laughs> all right, here we go. No, that's not it either. How did I lose that verse? What verse is it, Jeff? You know it. All scripture. It is. I was looking at, you're right, Timothy. Uh, Timothy. Timothy, you should know Timothy. All right. Uh, yeah, I was looking in chapter 4. That's why I didn't find it. All scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine. So how do we build doctrines? All the scripture. Yeah, by, by making sure we're not leaving out any scripture that might pertain to that. And some of the doctrines have hundreds of scriptures that pertain to them, and some less. But any doctrine worth its salt is going to have several scriptures, anyway, that are very clear and indisputable that will point to that truth. And um, it's dangerous because it's too easy to use your own interpretation if you just find one verse that supports your idea, it's dangerous. Be very careful. I knew a guy recently that came up with the idea that, that the Sabbath only had 12 hours. Other days had 24 hours, the Sabbath only had 12. And, and, and he just based that on one scripture, and his own unusual way of using that one scripture. You can, the strangest things, you can just come up with the strangest things. Uh, so, some people believe that um, we should observe all of the holy days from the Old Testament. Remember like the Passovers and all those. And there are plenty of scriptures to support the, the keeping of all those days. However, there are plenty of new covenant scriptures which say that those feast days were fulfilled by, that they were metaphors and not commandments, and that they were fulfilled by the work of Jesus Christ, and, and uh, therefore they're not to be viewed anymore as... You know, but that's so hard when they said that they'll be, they should be kept forever. It does say that, in perpetuity. And then he, Paul comes right along, and so does uh, Peter and some of the others, and says that was only not meant for Gentile Christians, that was only meant for the Jewish 
people, and these are metaphors of Christ's salvation. And even the Jerusalem Council, which was mostly Jews at the time, in Acts 15, came to the same conclusion, that those feast days and all that were not meant for the Gentile believers, and that they were never meant for the Gentile believers, and they were not part of God's commandments that He gave to the whole world. And so, we cannot, when you, when you have an argument that even happened in the Bible, right? You have an argument that even happened in the Bible, then how do you decide which side to come down on? Well, this was an argument between the Apostles and the Pharisaical Jews. Which side are you going to come down on? You're going to come down on the side of the Apostles, aren't you? Because what is the New Jerusalem founded on? It's the foundation of the Apostles, isn't it? The Twelve Foundations of the Apostles. And, and so, yes, we're going to come down on... And so, the Bible has arguments within it. You know that. That's not the only one. There are a number of other arguments within the Bible. And, and, and in those you have to be a good enough Bible student to see which one you come down on as a New Covenant Gentile Christian. Fortunately, in the New Testament, they never did have an argument over whether to keep the Seventh Day Sabbath. There are some Christians who try to put that argument about the feast days over against the Seventh Day Sabbath. But it doesn't work. Contextually, it absolutely does not work. You cannot see that they were discussing. That was not even in their discussion. It never came up in the New Testament era before the death of the Apostles. That idea of keeping any day other than Saturday never even came up. And so this, this uh, I mean for your weekly Sabbath. And so this idea that they try to put on it now by taking certain scriptures about the feast days and trying to apply them to the Sabbath and the abolition of Sabbath, it's just an excuse they're making to try to get out of the, the holiness of the Sabbath. But I can see how weaker minds, I say that, that, that sounds like I'm putting my mind ahead of others. It's just that there, there's a kind of person that knows just enough to be dangerous. You know what I mean by that? And if they're sincere, I'm sure God accepts their faith, uh, their efforts to be obedient. I'm sure He does. I'm not, I cannot say, you know, how God looks at everybody. He, he has to take a lot of things into consideration, especially our brain power. Because <laughs> we don't all have the same brain power, do we? But some people have a very hard time reasoning things out. Have you noticed that? And so they just get stuck on certain things. And, you know, God loves them. The Bible says, let no man judge you on these matters. So we really shouldn't judge the people. If they want to do those things, even though we're fully persuaded that God has told us that in the New Covenant that's not part of our, our, of our faith, we shouldn't judge them on those things. Now here's a weird one. Some people have come up with the idea that you only keep Sabbath once a month. They have what's called the Lunar Sabbath. Have you heard that? And you know, lunar means moon, and we get the same thing, lunatic, from that same origin. <laughs> I think how you could ever take the weekly Sabbath founded in Genesis on the seventh day of the week, folks, week, and say that means month, and you only keep it once a month. Uh, some kind of rationality has to be slipping here. <laughs> and yet, I know people who are actually quite smart on most things who have come over to that position. I just, what? How many gears have you slipped in there? <laughs> and look at Jesus' own example. Didn't He keep it weekly? Of course He did. Oh my goodness. Anyway, I don't know. This is the funny thing. Satan has a weird interpretation for every mind. If your mind is susceptible to weird interpretations, He's got one for you. He does. <laughs> so anyway, we really need the solidity of all the Scriptures, and once you've looked at the, how all the Scriptures weigh in on your doctrine, and you build your doctrine on that, then you have a solid platform for your faith. That's a wonderful thing. That's why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I, have, I cannot find fault with what our pioneers did. And I've tried, because I tr you want to know the truth? I didn't want to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, I'll tell you why. You know, we seem weird to most Christians, and it's not fun to be weird. I'd, I'd rather fit in better with some of the others who I know love Jesus too, you know. And, and, I, I, and so I didn't want to be an Adventist. I was hoping I would find some flaws. But, I, you know, when I really, really investigated these doctrines, they, they bear the weight of, of, of scriptural study. They really do. I did, the same thing. did you do the same thing? The same yeah. Thing. I was Baptist. Yeah, I was already a pastor. My wife says, Are you going to stay an Adventist? I says, I don't know. You're studying all these things out. I don't know yet. I'm going to make that decision after I see how 
biblical our positions are. I'd already been through seminary. But see, even in seminary, you're taught what to believe. I says, I'm going to study this for myself. Is that a stupid position? I don't think so. I think, I think that's where I think Adventist converts are actually fortunate because they, you know, they've reviewed all these things for themselves. And so many people that are born in the faith never really stood back and took a critical examination of the doctrine. But I did that. That's why people ask me, are you, were you born in the faith or are you a convert? I say, I'm a convert who was born in the faith. <laughs> <laughs> because I literally, I, I put it all aside and said, my future connection with this church is now on hold. I am going to find out for myself whether I believe these doctrines. And the Lord just really convinced me of them because I could see that they just, wow, they were solid. You could, you could find scriptures which seemed to be against them, but then when you put all the scriptures together, the best interpretation was still right there. So, <laughs> you did that with Ellen White, huh? Well, you know, people who, are, people who are honest enough to put Ellen White to the test come out believing in her. Yeah, because her writing is so scripturally sound. It's just astonishing. But Okay, well, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we love you. We love what you're teaching us. We're so thankful that we can base our faith on your word. And that when we do that, we're never led astray. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.